am pleased to be joined today by uh, Michael Anderley, who you're all familiar with, and Nathan Lowell, who many of you will be familiar with uh, already. Um, but if you're not already familiar with him, Nathan is best-selling author of multiple science fiction series, including tra The Traitor's Tales from the Golden Age of the Solar Clipper and The Smuggler's Tales and The Seeker's Tales from that same Golden Age. And he's recently published something that's a bit outside the norm for his sci-fi audience titled The Wizard's Butler. I started reading that last night, and I'm really enjoying it. He's also a two-time Parsec Award winner, and I've got to say, he's got an amazing voice. Nathan, welcome to Behind the Fiction. Thanks for having me. I, I would like to get this started uh, with a quick question about how you started in your bio on the website, you talk about the idea of you, you had been writing and then there was a long period with no writing and you started again and you really kind of got your start by podcasting your books. So talk to us for a minute, if you would, about the idea behind that. Well, growing up, I always wanted to be a writer and because it always seemed like it would be a cool thing to do. And then as I grew up and realized being a writer isn't really all that cool a thing to do, or at least wasn't. Um, I had to have another career to keep the roof over my head and the food on the table. And so I spent several careers um, until I stumbled in 2006 or so um, into podcasting when I started listening to it. And my day job was with the National Center on Severe and Sensory Disabilities. And our mission was to provide educational opportunities for people who couldn't see the screen or hear their instructor. So one of the difficulties was reaching students who were teachers in master's programs, particularly in blindness and visual impairment. And we needed to be able to get them high bandwidth content for people who had low bandwidth access. And I thought podcasting might be the way to do it. Along the way, I discovered patio books, which was a bunch of crazy people who written stuff and then recorded stuff and put it out as podcasts. And they sounded like they were having a lot of fun. And I wanted to learn how to podcast. And I thought the best way to do that is to try to podcast. And I thought patio books was a good place for me to start since all I had to do was write a novel and then record it and then <laughs> post it. And <clears throat> And so I thought, well, okay, can I write a novel? And I did. And can I record a novel? And I did. And can I post it? And I did. And the next thing I know, I need to write another novel because I've got people saying, okay, then what happens? Then what happens? Then what happens? <laughs> and so 20-something novels ago, in 2007, is when I started writing fiction seriously, more or less. I've been full-time since 2012. That's amazing. And the idea that you thought I'd like to get into podcasting by writing a novel instead of uh, the approach that I took where I'd like to learn about writing. So I'm going to go into podcasting so that I can talk to people like you and Michael and uh, and learn how to write. I feel like I've done a lot of podcasts. I've done probably five or six hundred. You have a d almost it's either daily or almost daily podcast where you're at 2010. Yeah, I call it the somewhat daily podcast talking on my morning walk. It's uh, the acronym is T-O-M-M-W. Uh, if, if you look at my Twitter feed, you'll see the picture of a tree with a brief weather description and the hashtag T-O-M-M-W. Uh, that lets people know that I'm out walking and that there should be a file coming along in a couple of hours. So it takes me 40 minutes to walk the two mile loop. And then it takes me about an hour to remember to post after I get home. <laughs> <laughs> and some days, some days I don't remember, uh, and so people who see the picture can then contact me and say, "Did you press publish this afternoon, this morning?" Um, and they do. They they let me know that I forgot to push press the publish button because I do forget. I heard a story, and I'll, I'll ask Michael to tell this story about a walk that you and he took at a conference a year or so ago. So, Michael, you want to jump in and, and the two of you share that story? Well, uh, uh, sure. And I'm probably going to have to say that my memory might not be as, as uh, excellent as Nathan's. But we were at a hotel, and we were there for the SIF, or the Science Fiction Writers of America 
Nebula conference and we were going to go get something to eat. And I don't even remember, I know it was in California, but I forget the name of that city. Or is this, yeah, this is in California. This wasn't Pittsburgh. No, this wasn't Pittsburgh. But oh, we no, were, this, this is the, the Hugos. This was the Hugos, yeah, because we were yes. in San Jose. There it is. That's the explanation why I couldn't remember, connected to the Nebulas. But during this talk, I think Nathan's like, we'll just walk. And I'm like, okay, what's the address? And Nathan's like, we'll just get a map. We'll go over to, over here to the front desk and we'll ask them for a map. And I'm like, and so I pulled out my phone and I start the process is Nathan wants to get a map. It's not going to take us long to get lost. The next scene is we have gone out one set of doors and we're outside. Nathan is looking left. He's looking right. He's looking at the map. And I pull out my phone and go, we're lost already. <laughs> and we got lost many more times during that walk. <laughs> and did you yeah. find the restaurant? Eventually. <laughs> was it the one that you were you were going for or you just settled for something? No, it was the one we were going for. We we, we found it eventually. It just yeah. took us took us a little bit of I mean, why we would want to go with a map when we have excellent GPS. And, and then I was sitting there going, and he has an Android phone. No wonder he's lost and he wants to use a map. So I'm giving him all sorts of crap about it. But it was a real pleasure for me. It was a lot of fun. It's a memory that I hold forever. But it was funny that we give us a map and we're lost immediately. It, there was no hesitation between know what we're doing and don't know where we're going. <laughs> I'm curious, um, when did the, the two of you meet for the first time? Actually, that was in Austin. I was in Austin. Yeah, you want to tell that story? Well, only only as much as I'm going to go to a certain part because he and I definitively don't remember what he was wearing. And I'm sure he is right. But in my mind, I'll tell up to that point. So we were at the Smarter Artist Summit. And this is just probably a couple of years ago. And uh, so we're there and, and uh, it's one large room. And after I think it was probably one of my talks or something, I was in the back and I was answering some questions. And whenever that happens, I always want to make sure people are included. Well, there's this really kind looking gentleman, you know, and I, I mean that in the best word possible, but he's, he's dressed. What I remember was he was dressed like in a suit type of situation, which is not what I wear at all. And during that time I was all just black t-shirt and blue jeans and I've moved up to black collar shirt and blue jeans. And so, you know, I'm constantly, you know, and I'm feeling bad because he keeps letting everyone get in front of him. And so he's like, oh, you want to talk? That Go right ahead. And I'm like, oh, man, this gentleman is this is just so nice. And so finally, I'm like, you know, how can I help you? And so he turns around and he goes, I understand you have a character named after me. And I realize, uh, you know, Nathan Lowell, which is certainly one of them, he goes, is that true? And I pretty much jump him at that moment. <laughs> And I'll let you take it from there, Nathan. Yeah, I, my typical con wear is business casual. I almost always wear a sport coat just because I need the extra pockets to carry stuff. Um, and so I'm standing there, and I had my fans have been asking me about this Nathan Lowell character. Who's, I think at one point they said he was a vampire, but he's actually a werewolf or something, or vice versa. I, I have them. You're right. No, you have it right. It's a werewolf. But... It's a werewolf. And uh, they asked if, if I knew Michael and I, at that point, you know, I only knew of him. I didn't know him, I never met him. And so we're at Smarter Artists and Mike gets up and he does his, he does his talk and we're, there's this 15, 20 minute mixer break in between sessions. And so he goes back to the back of the room and of course people are lined up to talk to him. And, and so I saunter onto the back of the room and, and sort of stand there and wait. And, because you know these are people who who are desperate to talk to him, and I I only wanted to introduce myself, so there wasn't a lot of desperation there. I could I could stand and wait and let them talk and um, and have their moment with Michael, and, and I figured you know sooner or later we'll get a chance to say hello. And so I walked up to him. I said, "So uh, I understand you have this character uh, named Nathan Lowell in one of your books." And he said, "Yeah, as a matter of fact." And I said, I held up my hand. I said, "I'm Nathan Lowell." <laughs> and, and, and he and, and he's like this this blank sort of processing what and then the next thing I know I've got this Anderley perched on my chest it was a, it was it was quite, it was quite I, I grabbed him I was like so excited to meet because you know Nathan is is and we've talked to John Conroe but Nathan is in his solar clipper series 
is one of the ones I love the most. And so, you know, Nathan's always been like one of those guys I would love to meet. And he just appears, <laughs> you know, I'm not expecting him. And he's like, well, I am, you know, it's like, I am God, right? Not, not literally, but it's just one of those, I am Nathan Lowell. And it's just like, I, I, you know, once I unpacked myself, I'm like, wait a minute, he might not be a touchy sort of guy. And I'm like, I'm terribly sorry, you know, probably shouldn't have just hugged you right there like I did. But uh, no, I, it was a fantastic moment in my life to, you know, have Nathan just go, yeah, that's me. <laughs> One of my so, favorite things about attending cons with Michael is that this is the way he is. And I'm, I'm similar in that the people whose work I love, I'm just like an absolute fanboy and I make a, an idiot of myself. <laughs> Not that Michael makes an idiot of himself, but uh, he, he shares that same gene. And when he meets someone whose work he loves and admires, um, he's, he lets you I'm know. I'm a fanboy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's really cool. That is, that is it. It's, it's one of those situations where I was looking at there. I'm like, why haven't I reached out to Nathan? At least unlike John, I didn't know John when I reached out to him. I had no idea if he was aware of who I was or anything else, just that I was a fan. I'm like, why am I not reaching out to Nathan? I've met him a few times. He'd probably be willing to come on this. And the goal behind this podcast, behind the fiction, is we want to hear the stories behind the stories. And so for me, I probably started listening to you somewhere around 2010, 2011 in patio books. That's where I found you. And so I'm going through those and you couldn't get them out fast enough for me. And your voice was fantastic. And so, you know, it moved on and, and went everything else. But, you know, you have something kind of what I would call a slice of life type of storytelling. And it was, you know, engaged me with the characters. And it was a strong component of me recognizing that you don't have to have as, and I went and did a little research, good me, <laughs> but you were interviewed back in June of 2012 by Eric Wex of Wired Magazine with an article titled Space Opera Without Explosions, Nathan, Nathan Lowell's Solar Clipper Series. I'm kind of curious, what was it like for you to be interviewed for Wired Magazine back then? I, it was just another interview. It's, uh, people wanted to know, you know, what do you do? How do you do it? Why do you do it? Uh, and, uh, my wife has heard the spiel so many times now she could give it. Um, but I was, I was tired of space opera where the, the overlap between space opera and military science fiction was unity. And I thought there had to be other stories that we could tell that would satisfy the, the space opera DNA that didn't involve having a war. So what other kinds of conflicts are there? There have to be all kinds of them. And so I started out with the idea of what if, what if we didn't send a military? What if we didn't send the Navy? What if we didn't send the Air Force? What if we sent UPS? <laughs> what if we sent the Coast Guard? Yeah, what do you send? So what, what would those stories look like? What would those people do? How would, that, how would that translate into a story that people might want to read? And, and how would that tie back to my, you know, my roots in science fiction? This is early Heinlein and Ellie Norris and and some of those, some of those people back in the fifties and, and early sixties, and those stories, I don't see those stories very much anymore. So how do we, uh, how do we close that gap? What kind of stories would I write? And so when 2007 rolled around and I decided that I needed to write a story so that I could learn how to podcast, um, that's where I started. Go ahead, Steve, because so, I'll let you take this one. Yeah, so so what happened after that? I mean, you 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 said that people listened, and all of a sudden, it's like you realized, oh, I you know, what comes next? What do, what do I do next? And obviously, what came next was writing the next book. But at at what point did you think to yourself, I can make a living as an author? Oh, when my day job left me in 2012. Good, good um, timing. <laughs> yeah, well, I had I had a few novels out at that point, and I had just gotten. I was originally with a small press and got the rights back from the books because the press went basically defunct. Uh, and so I spent a year and a half republishing what they had published and catching up with what they hadn't. Um, and then just kept going. Uh, in 2012, my, my soft money day job at the university went away. Uh, and so when it went away, I was faced with either packing up and moving to try to find another academic job. I had my PhD by then. Um, in fact, I got my PhD in 2004. Um, so 
I had, I could have packed up and tried to get another job in distance education at another university, but my wife was a full professor at the university here in Greeley, so she already had tenure, and I would have had to start over. And so she, I said, okay, well, I'm not going to leave Colorado and drag you away from a full tenure job. Why don't I just see if I can make a go of this? And within three years, we made a go of it. So between 2007 and 2012, did you see your writing as a hobby, uh, a calling, just something fun, or did you see it as something that could support you at some point? I, until, until 2010, I never tried to sell a book. So I was giving away the podcast audio for free. Um, and the donations were you know, pin money. You know, was, you know, I, was, I was making as much in donations as most trad pub new authors were getting for their advances. And I was getting that in a quarter. They were getting it once. So, um, you know, for me, it was, it was pin money. It was, it's like, okay, well, I need to upgrade my recorder. I need to get a new computer. I need to, you know, just sort of rolled it back in. And in 2010, I was getting like 15 emails a week from people who wanted to buy the book and read it so that they could hear it in their, in, in their own head rather than in my voice, um, which didn't work out very well because even when they were reading it themselves, they kept hearing my voice, which is <laughs> guilty. Yeah, it's kind of a problem. I I had to show uh, Nathan at one of these events where we had crossed paths again. I'm like, see, and I had his original, I still have your original patio books on my phone. <laughs> so um, in, 20, in 2009, I started doing queries and doing the usual traditional publishing and realized that the, the best answer that I could get from an agent is no, because even if I got a yes, it would be two years before that I'd see one of those books where anybody could buy it. Mm. And so it's like, okay, this is, this is not viable. Uh, this is not gonna work. So I s pursued self-publishing and got tied up with a small press for a while and then went back to self-publishing. And I, you know, I've, I've had publishers contact me, but it's like, you can't really afford to pay me what this franchise is worth to me. And you can't you can't make that money back yourself. So I can't ask you to pay me what it's worth. So no, I'm gonna self-publish it. I'm gonna keep self-publishing. It's not that I wouldn't take a trad pub deal, but I, you, you, gotta, you gotta make it worth my while. I'm, I'm not sure you can. So um, in 2012, there was some question whether or not uh, we were going to be able to replace my income. Uh, and at that, that was the point where it ceased being something that I did on the side and started being something that I did. Uh, and that was really only because the day job left me. Um, we needed the money for gas and tanks in Iraq. So the blind and deaf people didn't get to have our national center anymore. Oh. And so, uh, so I started getting trying to write more and do more. And so let me ask, this is not terribly relevant, maybe it is, but are you saying then that during that time, during the 2012, that the reason that your job left you and the center folded, you believe is because the budget went to the national, the military? Yeah, in 2012, um, all grant funding pretty much dried up unless you're in one of the major research institutions and University of Northern Colorado is not one of the major institutions. Uh, we are one of the more significant special education colleges, but we didn't we we don't have the the cachet of a of a Cal State or Duke or Brown or or any of the major research institutions that are around. And so, um, several a lot of the smaller institutions that relied on uh, grant funding, particularly from the National Science Foundation. Uh, National Science Foundation's budget got cut. They had to go where they could put their money 
they had to call people off. Um, a lot of a lot of the places that used to get funding didn't get funding anymore, and we were one of them. Okay, I did not know that. So if Steve doesn't have, and you got your next question, Steve? No, or go, I'll go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. I, I so, think people want to hear you two talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I have a question. I had this question ever since I first started listening to it. Horatio, not exactly a common first name, and Wong, not a typical surname either. How and why and what became or how did you decide Horatio Wong was your character's name? Okay, his, his, name, his full name is Ishmael, Ishmael Horatio Wong. Okay. Okay. Uh, and the reason also was- Also not a common first name. Also name not a common first name. No. Uh, I thought, wouldn't it be cute if I started a, if I started a book, call me Ishmael. Okay, how do I make that work? <laughs> so I thought, okay, well, what is his full name? And so I went, okay, Ishmael, Horatio Hornblower, what other thing doesn't go here? <laughs> and so I went with Wong, spelled W-A-N-G, um, Ishmael Horatio Huang, and the first paragraph just sort of flew out of my fingers and the rest sort of followed. When did you decide where his father was and what business he had? Uh, I knew where his father was. I didn't know what business he had. Um, I knew his father stayed behind, but I didn't know what he did. Mm -hmm. um, and when Ishmael graduated from the academy and went back to Diurnia, I knew mm -hmm. he had to find him. Uh, it wasn't actually a goal. It was just sort of like, okay, yeah, he, he'd be curious. It's not somebody who's been in his life for the first 18 years or 19 years, so it's 20 years. It's like, okay, well, yeah, he'd, he'd sort of try to look him up. But then I thought, what if, what if he saw him every day and didn't know who he was until one day finally They make the connection. I, I thought that was fascinating reading that when you look through it and you realize that, you know, he's been these this breakfast. He's you know his dad's been feeding him forever, and then of course you made me freaking hungry. I don't know how many times I had a big breakfast due to reading your books or how chubby I got because of it. But you know I, I want to go and visit that particular place to slide up to the bar and you know to be told I, I want to get and then I don't remember exactly how you describe the meals themselves two up two under but it was such a, a an experience to think about it it's just a diner that you would have in the back country of Texas or wherever you're from out in the middle of the great dark and that was and that was the point that was the the thing about the thing about food the thing about meals uh, I spent five years in the Coast Guard and one of those years was floating in a medium endurance cutter off the dark east coast, uh, hurricane patrol, search and rescue. And when you're, when you're on board ship, when you're out at sea, you don't really think about what you're doing. Uh, you can't really think about what you could be doing instead or what you'd rather be doing because you've got to be doing what you're doing. And the only thing that really matters is what's for dinner, what's for lunch. Um, can I get a cup of coffee? Uh, because everything else is routine. Everything else is the mission. Everything else is outside of you. Mm -hmm. And so food and meals, uh, civilian clothing, um, leisure activities become a real interesting challenge. And so I really leveraged that and remembered that very clearly that, that it doesn't matter that we that we saved a ship. What matters is that we got steak for dinner. Well, it's it's fascinating to me because as you're talking about this, I, it, the questions that I had at the beginning when I was listening, because whoever starts with the most compelling accomplishment 
is brewing coffee correctly, using cold water. I mean, these are very specific attributes. And so now as I like only learned that you were part of the Coast Guard, that I own, you know, that I knew you had some of the background. Of course, you look like a walking professor no matter what you wear. Mm -hmm. But we move forward with this and you realize, well, coffee is a big deal inside of academia. And then coffee, of course, I, I never clued into the ship part. You know, how important, but you make coffee a pivotal aspect of the whole series, including getting the burnt, the beans burned correctly. Now, I personally can't stand coffee, but you make me want to enjoy coffee and be able to cold press it or do whatever. So what was behind your thinking that coffee was such a pivotal? And of course, Steve will, you know, Steve will enter, we'll talk and he'll be like, ah, give me a second. I gotta go get another cup of coffee. So Steve, you can talk coffee because I certainly can't. Well, yeah, I, I have my cup right here because it's always it's always in front of me but I, I yeah to follow up on michael's question it what is that a love of yours or is it was was it just something that you wanted to be a, a component of the series well some of each uh, i coffee has been part of my life since uh, i grew up back in maine uh, we always had a coffee an aluminum percolator sitting on the back of the wood stove. There was always coffee in it. Um, sometimes it was fresh coffee, sometimes it was tar, sometimes it was good coffee, uh, sometimes it was just coffee. Uh, and so coffee was part of my life for a very long time, even before I got into Coast Guard. And then I joined the, well, two years before I joined the Coast Guard. I joined the Coast Guard at 17 so that I could avoid the draft. Um, in 2000, I would have been, I've been out of school 50 years. <laughs> yeah, it would have been, would have been probably late, late 60s or early 70s. Yeah, in 1970, I graduated from high school and I was 17. And I didn't have to register for the draft until October. And so I enlisted in the Coast Guard in September. And so I had my 18th birthday in boot camp. And they were very confused because I didn't have a draft card. <laughs> I don't have to register for the draft, I'm only 17. And then I couldn't turn it in and they couldn't draft me because I was already enlisted and I couldn't go to Vietnam unless I volunteered. And I was, the only reason I enlisted was not to go to Vietnam. So that was gonna, that wasn't going to happen. Um, and so uh, by the time I got into the military, by the time I got into the shipboard life and time I get into the service, coffee was, coffee was really important. Coffee is part of the routine. Coffee is part of, the bonding, coffee is part of the smoke with you got them. It's part of the culture. Uh, and yes, there are tea drinkers. Um, they're not necessarily looked down on, but- Not they, necessarily, which means yes, they are. Um, <laughs> but you know, there are people who enjoy tea. Um, I like a cup of tea now and again myself. Yeah, there, there are people who would prefer a soft drink. A there, are, there are, Perhaps. there are, yeah. yes. Um, and there's, there's nothing wrong with that, I like uh, but but uh, <laughs> but coffee coffee was coffee was part of the culture. Coffee was part of of being on the ship. Coffee was part of being underway. Coffee was part of part of the life that I wanted to 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 show that it's it's common things, it's little things that make the biggest difference, and and not necessarily the war. The, mm -hmm. the idea that, that y you, have to, you have to risk your life to be heroic. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I was really went back to the idea of what, what makes a hero. The hero is somebody who, who goes to work in a dead end job for 50 years to keep the roof over his head, to keep his family fed, to keep her children in clothing, to work two or three jobs. That's, that's, that's heroic. There's, I know a lot of, I think a lot of people can relate to that level of heroism a lot more than somebody who's going to go over the hill, you know, charge the trenches and, and all the rest. So I really wanted to have stories about real people mm -hmm. doing things that, that real people might actually do. Um, not that, you know, not that Honor Harrington isn't a real people, but that... It, she was a special case. Uh, Maz Rokosigan is a special case. 
Mm -hmm. uh, all of these people have agency, they have position, they have um, title. You know, I mean, James Kirk is the captain. What, what about the stories? What about the red-shirted crewman? What did he do before he got tapped? Oh, right, away sure. Before he died? <laughs> yeah, before he died. What did he do? And, and, who, and who took his job? <laughs> who who did his job well, when that he didn't is such come? A great question. Who didn't who, when he didn't come back? Because he didn't come back, <laughs> and it, it's a five-year mission. You know, personnel did not send out a replacement. I never <laughs> considered that, but it's really funny. It's kind of like, what are you wearing today? Oh, I'm going to wear red. Ah, call up George. He's about to come. <laughs> so, so those are the kinds of questions that I was like, okay, what? Do, what how can I tell a compelling story about somebody who's not the captain? About somebody who's not rich? about somebody who's not and of course now spoiler alert now he is the captain <laughs> yeah, he's rich uh, and now i now i don't know you what kind of start a quarter share half share full share double share you know you kind of went up the rank you, you can hit there sometime right yeah you got there somewhere although i could just i mean i'm going to ask a question about coffee again but the fact that you killed his love not my most pleasant experience in my life reading that was horrible why would you do that man why, what, what possessed you to do that? Uh, I had to. No, you uh, didn't. Yes, I did. Oh, wait, I shouldn't actually talk about this. <laughs> um, the, the difficulty is that in, in ownership, I wasn't done with Ishmael Huang. I wanted to tell more stories about Ishmael Huang. But for six books, it was pick up a cargo here, make a profit. Sell it there, drop it. Next next cargo, 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 and each step up the line was a new level: quarter, half, full, mm -hmm. double, captain, owner. Uh, and I ran out of pay grades, <laughs> <laughs> and so I wanted to tell some other stories. And I thought, well, what kind of other stories can we tell about a guy who's forty years old and not a hero? Um, and the answer came to me when my sister died of cancer. Um, you live a charmed life until you don't. And then the question isn't whether you're gonna get knocked down. The question is, what are you gonna do after that? Are you gonna get back up? Are, are you gonna curl up in a ball? Are you going to, what? And so I thought, okay, that's, that's a worthy, that's a worthy art. So what I needed to do is to bump him out of his, his cycle. I needed to bump him out of his comfort level. I needed to bump him out of his, um, his comfort zone. I needed to break him from the, be the captain, buy it here, get the cargo here, take it there, get the next cargo, go again. In order to do that, I had to have something traumatic happen to him because we don't make significant changes to our lives unless something traumatic forces us to do so. Um, my life really didn't change too much when my day job left me. Um, it did change a lot when my sister died. Mm. So what does that look like? How does that work? And it was also about the time that um, I was getting comments from the fans saying you can't kill him because I think that was when Harry Potter died. Uh, and so uh, I was getting these sort of, okay, well, you can't kill him. And I couldn't, I couldn't really give him a happily ever after because that would be the end of it. Mm -hmm. And so I had to do something else. And something else had to be traumatic. And the only question was going to be, how am I going to do it? Uh, and the answer, I had a whole, I like, I had a smorgasbord of, of ways, um, some of which were um, a little outrageous, some of which were kind of pedestrian. And then the one that I ended up with was the one that I needed to have because it was senseless. And because it was senseless. Um, it gave him the impetus he needed to move on, to do something else, to find a way to get back up and to follow him through that process. 
So I'm going to, before Steve asks his next question, I have to ask, out of five years being in the Coast Guard, how many years did you have good quality coffee? Most of them. Well, okay. All right. Most of them. It was, the, the, the quality of the coffee was, was generally good. Um, it, you know, it's not, we're talking common coffee. We're talking Folgers for the most part, um, the supermarket level coffee. It was, it was okay, it was good. Sounds like my, supermarket my, level cola. My, yeah, my, my, favorite, my favorite brand of, of coffee is, is eight o'clock. Um, I love eight o'clock coffee. I grew up with eight o'clock coffee. Uh, I, I, when I was a kid, I used to work in a factory violating child labor laws uh, with my father. And uh, well, he wasn't a child, but he, I worked with him for him. And it was right across the street from uh, Atlantic and Pacific Coffee Roaster, AMP. And they roasted eight o'clock coffee in that building across the street from this factory. And it smelled delicious all the time. Uh, and so that smell of eight o'clock coffee, that eight o'clock coffee has been my go-to brand forever because for the most part, I can always get it. Excellent, Steve, your turn. And, and I, I have enjoyed that as well. My favorite brand of coffee is whatever's on sale at the supermarket. I am not a coffee snob. I just enjoy the taste of, of coffee. A question for both of you. I, Michael's readers know uh, what happened, or they know how they reacted when Michael, uh, Michael the author, killed an important character in, in a long-running series. So I'm, I'm curious, uh, Nathan, what your fans thought when that happened in your series. Did you get, did you get pushback? And then I'd, I'd like Michael to answer the same question. I got yeah, a lot of pushback. Um, not enough. You apparently didn't bring her back from the dead. I did not bring her back from the dead. Uh, I got a lot of pushback. Uh, the, the fans uh, hated it. They really, really didn't like it because it was a gut punch. Um, and there, there was a, some of some of my writer friends were very upset with me because I had violated my my contract with the reader uh, by having this sort of Pollyanna esque universe and having suddenly the world end to have this catastrophic occurrence happen and my response has always been in quarter share it starts when his mother dies in quarter share his best friend is beaten up and left for dead all the way through the series there has been this sort of back ground of violence, of danger, of you're in outer space, ships break. Um, the Chernyakova, which is one of the ships in, in Captain's Share. Uh, the entire crew dies because they were careless. There's this long, long, long thread of everything went well, right up to the point where it didn't. And if you thought that meant that nothing bad happens, you didn't read the story that I wrote. And, and in a certain sense, I, I understand that that's, that's probably a little vicious of me, but it's also, also one of the realities that I was trying to write when I wrote the first six books, the, the, the Seeker's Tales is an interesting set because that's the follow-on of Ishmael and how he recovers from this. And, and people were, it's like, oh, this is, this, he's not Ishmael. It's like, Duh! hello? He's not Ishmael. He's, he's Ishmael after catastrophe. He's Ishmael after tragedy. He's Ishmael trying to recover. He's Ishmael he, trying to heal. What does that look like? What does that feel like? Yes. Yes, it was tragic. And yes, I do get a lot of pushback. The only, the only one that um, I, I took real sort of, 
I had regret for uh, was the woman who said that uh, she couldn't read any of my books ever again because she'd lost her daughter the same way. Oh. And I thought, okay, you get a buy. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Everybody else, you didn't read the book that I wrote. Well, I think the difference there, though, if, if I could speak for those that haven't been had the chance to talk to you directly, those that died, we, we weren't emotionally invested with his mom. His mom just flitter accident, poof. We didn't, you know, um, forget the character's name, but you know what? He, he wasn't, we weren't that engaged with him when that happened. Oh my goodness, how engaged were we? And then you offer. <laughs> that, that was hard. That was hard. It was hard. It, and it was, if you, if you can find the podcast of that, chapter mm -hmm. where I tried to read it. <laughs> um, oh, that, would that be was hard. that was like the, the one that could publish is like the 25th take. Oh, uh, really? That bad? That was that bad. Uh, it was real hard to read. Um, it was hard to do, but it was what needed to happen for the story, for the character, for for the saga to be able to continue. And it was it was what had to happen. And the only question is the detail. It's like, okay, do we do we have an engine explosion? Do we have a fire? Do we have, you know, something something going over the ship? Do we have a shuttle accident? Do we have, you know, mm -hmm. there are always all kinds of different ways to do it. Um, and the fact that it was literally an accidental death senseless death which took us back to the beginning of the story took us back to just before quarter share and so i i liked liked it's not the right word but from a technical standpoint the call back to losing his mother in a senseless kind of accident did mm -hmm. that 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 appealed to me for that purpose but she she had to go because otherwise i've got a happy leave her after and that's the end of the story i could have just as well killed him <laughs> you thought stuff was bad by killing her <laughs> now, <laughs> yeah so so I, I i can't i there's no there's no once you have a happily ever after or even happily for now it, it's very difficult to have a, a continuing story beyond that and there were stories that i wanted to tell and i thought there were stories mm -hmm. that were interesting that are worth telling and so yeah that's why i did it and michael you had a a very specific reason for the death in your series as well i just want to make a note that it was not nearly as empathetic or, or, or as engaging as Nathan's. I did not have, I, I was just being selfish. I had read another series where the main character had a, a, a significant other come into existence and I was put off by it. I didn't enjoy the other character, the, the pseudo spouse. And I'm like, I just wanted to read more about this character, not her with another guy. So as my story com continues, I find out that I'm in, stuck in the same situation where the guy is starting to take over part of the story because he has to be around all of the time, and I didn't want that. So I'm like, well, kill him. <laughs> my problem was the fact that I didn't realize how much the fans liked him. <laughs> and so I'm writing the scene, and similar to, I didn't have to thankfully have to narrate or anything, but I was crying as I'm writing him, and my wife laughed now. She says it's like, Snoopy whenever he would be sitting there typing on his little typewriter bawling bah, wah, 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 wah. and then so when I came in from typing the scene out she sees why are you crying and then I tried to explain to her the grief that you feel even though I had planned to kill him and she has zero empathy none she is in fact humorously harassing me about this and wah, wah, wah. it does it to this day if you ask her she'll go oh I remember that and then she'll go right into it so as I'm writing the final scene and I'm killing him off, I'm like, what if I'm wrong? What if something happens, you know, that, uh, that this is a bad thing? So I, I do what I call the soap opera death, where I give him one foot with an excuse and then I kill him off. <laughs> Book releases on Friday. The shit storm that happened from there was that I, that I immediately announced a new 
series with him coming back of four books. I had not planned on writing this series. To this day, it was a pain in the neck. And I call it, you know, my four book apology for having done that. Um, but yes, I, uh, yeah, that, that was hard. <laughs> Fans write to you and they go like, I almost threw my Kindle through the wall when this happened. And uh, it, it, it still affected me years later. About two weeks ago, a lady had said, you know, I stopped listening to the books, book nine. When you did this, I'm done. I'm sorry, but I can't listen anymore. And I'm like, um, well, that's terribly sorry. I apologize. Just so you know, he comes back. Here's the first book of the Comeback Apologies series. <laughs> and I get something really nice from her five minutes later. Oh, this is fantastic. I'll continue listening. Thank you. Poof, done. <laughs> I have, I have people who have said, no, you're done. You, 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 I can't listen to you anymore. I can't read you anymore. And I'm like, okay, I understand. Yeah, yeah. Happens. Sorry, but as if we can go back and change the books <laughs> to make them happy. We, we can't. Well, and and I, think, I think for everyone who's, who is upset, uh, there are maybe a hundred who aren't, either aren't upset or aren't aren't pleased enough to tell you that they're pleased with it, but aren't upset enough to tell you that they're pissed about it and recognize that it's part of the story and continue on. And oh, it hurts so bad. Because it's such empathy that you go with, with Ishmael and, you know, engaging with him and everything else. And then you're just like, oh, now you're going to go through books of pain. It's not something to look forward to, man. Just telling you, Nathan. <laughs> I understand. Well, let, let's talk... Uh, for a minute about writing a long popular series. So you had the six book series and then Ishmael continued in another series and then there was another, and I don't, I don't know. I, I assume that was a spinoff as well. It, it sounds like it. Um, and in reading your blog, which I was looking through today, I saw some things that you'd written this year where you were just having a hard time coming up with a story idea that you were excited about. Is it difficult after 12 books in the same? And is someone going to die? It, yeah, well, I'm not going to ask that question, but. I will. <laughs> is it difficult to, to come up with an idea that, that gets the juices flowing again? Uh, okay, the six book, the first six books, the first share, the share books, they, they sort of flowed because they were they, each each one had a little a little gimmick. You know, it had a, a pay grade that they had to make, and it was a problem that he had to overcome when he got the new job. And so each one of those came along and did pretty well. Um, back way back, even in the beginning in 2007, I wrote four novels that year, and the fourth book was uh, the first shaman's tale that told the backstory of Sarah Krug, who joined the ship at Half Share. Uh, but I went back too far and told the story of her father. Uh, and so that was, that was fun. That was an interesting story to tell. Um, then in 2009, I was challenged to write uh, NaNoWriMo in half a month. So 50,000 words in two weeks, 15 days. Uh, and then I, people started piling on. It's like, well, you can't write science fiction because we know you can write that much science fiction in two weeks. We'd like you to write fantasy. And so in 2009, I wrote Ravenwood, which is the first of my fantasy books um, uh, about a story of a woman who doesn't get magic with puberty, she gets magic with menopause. And she thinks she's going insane because strange things are happening to her. And so that turned into a trilogy um, where she followed her path in typical epic fantasy form uh, to, to her final position and, and I have to get back to that universe because it's a lot of fun. Um, and then after that, I went back to, um, I, I wanted to follow up with Ownershare because that, it took me a couple of years to get back to Ownershare uh, and to pick up Ishmael and his recovery and to see what that would look like. And along the way, I, I, I came up with this idea of, okay, well, we've seen we, we've seen the universe from this side. What does it look like from the other side? And so I had a pair of characters that I was, that I had played with for, for some time. I never really wrote a story about them. 
Um, but those characters became the smugglers' tales. And so they became sort of the outlaws and gave me an opportunity to explore the universe from the not sanctioned view of the universe uh, and really kind of shifted the way the universe is pictured. If you, if you look at it from both sides, it's, it's a very different view than when you look at it just from Ishmael's view. Uh, and then I, were, I did the three books for Ishmael's recovery. I did three books that with Natalia and Zoya that fall into the gap because there's a big gap between double share and captain share. There's a big time gap because you have to have so much time in grade before you can become a captain. And so I plugged those three books into that time gap. So while Ishmael is working his way up through the ranks and you're not seeing him, these two women are having adventures in the deep dark. Uh, so that was pretty much fun. That was, that was easy to, that was relatively easy to do. But once I got the first book down, then the sequels sort of fall in place good, easily. Um, Cape Grace, 2019 Cape Grace was hard because it was the sequel to um, South Coast, but it was also the prequel to Half Share. And it was not a pleasant story to tell. It was a, it was a hard story. Uh, it was a tragic story to tell. I knew it was tragic. Everybody who, who knows Half Share knows that it's a tragic story and it's going to end badly. And it had to end badly. Um, not as bad as owners, but badly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it took me a, it took me a year and probably three hundred thousand words to find the hundred and twenty thousand that went together to Oof. make to make Cape Grace. Uh, and it took all year. Uh, and then at the end of that, I'm like kind of burnt. Mm. Uh, and so I started asking fans, like, okay, well, give me an idea, give me throw me throw me give me a story prompt, give me something. And so I got all kinds of stuff, and a lot of people will give you an idea. Uh, and the problem is you can't write a book on an idea. It's like, well, I'd, I'd like to see this. It's like, okay, well, that's a scene. Like, I can't, I can't, there's no art there. There's no story there. And, and finally, one guy pinged me on Facebook one morning and said, um, you know, that scene in Fantasia when Mickey Mouse and the wizard and he gets into trouble, what if, what if Mickey Mouse didn't have magic? What if, what if it was the wizard's butler and he, he wasn't magical? What would, what would his story be? And I'm thinking, okay, yeah, what would his story be? And so it took me, it probably took me like a day, day and a half to come up with, okay, what time frame? What am I, you know, so is it, this is the wizard with a pointy hat and the stone tower and he's got a butler at the front door. What is that? That's, that doesn't, that doesn't, that doesn't work. What is, what is the, what is the, problem what is this a story about what's the MacGuffin here what's it how does this and it just sort of started me rolling with the wizard's butler and it's like okay this is this is a no risk story this is like okay i'm gonna i'm gonna throw this together and we'll see if we can have some fun we'll do a little urban fantasy on it we'll bring it into current day we'll have a modern day wizard we'll have um, a butler. What's the butler's problem? Well, the butler served too many tour, too many tours in Afghanistan, and he's a little bit broken. And finds something in being a butler that helps him heal. Okay, I can I can work with that. Um, who's the but what's the wizard's problem? Well, we have to have a magical artifact. So okay, we get a cursed magical artifact, and and it just took off. It just went from there. And I think I, I think I spewed that out, and I'm pretty sure I did it in about 50 days. I got the first draft of 100, 120,000 words in about 50 days, uh, so less than two months. Um, and it was just that's a good pace. In 2000, well, since October, my goal is 2,000 new words a day every day. Uh, so 100,000 word novels, 50 days. Uh, I last month and a half, I haven't been able to do that because I don't have a project that's pulling me forward. Uh, I had all kinds of projects that I could leverage for the first six months, but around half a million words in 180 days, uh, which is not bad. I've got, I've got five, I've got three novels. I've got three novels waiting in, in first and second draft mode now. I've got covers coming for two of them. I'm going to give you a quick warning that we might be joined by a fourth person. 
one of the people inside of LMBPN, Kelly O'Donnell, is a major fan of yours. And I was talking with her last week and she was talking about how she's, I believe, maybe her fifth or sixth time through the Trader's Tales. And so um, we, Stephen and I work with her all of the time. And I just happened to notice that she was on in Slack and I go, how awesome would it be if, if, if she wanted to, because she is, I mean, reads what, three to four books a day, Steve, something she like that? A, yes, she is a voracious reader and she remembers things, which is amazing. And um, yes, and when, when she loves a series, I, uh, I'm glad she wasn't here while we were talking about the death of a loved one. <laughs> yes, yes, that's, <laughs> but that was probably good because she might have had a few choice words and she's definitely one of those individuals. So if she gets to come on, because I, I texted her and she said, I'd love to, but I, I have little ones here. Let me threaten them and then I will. <laughs> so whether or not they threat, she's a grandmother, but, um, and, and be able to do it. But, you know, it, we all share, certainly within our group, we all share reading. That is, you know, what drives us and what ended up joining us together through all of this. And so, you know, it will always be one, one of the cool memories of my life when you came up and said hi, when I realized who you were. And, you know, being able to name one of my characters after an author, I never assumed I would ever meet, you know, to, to do it. And so it's, it's been a huge honor for me to, um, to support that. And I know that there are a lot of my fans, which is what made me think of Kelly in the first place. There are a lot of my fans who love your stories. And if they don't know about you, because I've mentioned you and your stories before, well, then I wanted to put them out here for Behind the Fiction. And it's like, look, here is another great series. This is, is, you know, if you like Slice of Life, if you like everything we've been talking about, you need, you owe it to yourself to try Trader's Tales and at least see what's going on and to see whether or not coffee can, can, can be made interesting. It can, you know. Spoiler we'll alert. Coffee, yes, coffee and blue jeans. Blue jeans. Coffee and blue jeans. Like, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it's, 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 an, it's an odd, it's an odd place. Um, Somebody accused me of writing literary science fiction, or science literary fiction. Uh, and I was like, okay, yeah, okay, I can accept that. Um, <laughs> I have no, the beard. There's no, there's no, there's no place for that. There's no category for that on Amazon. So I want space opera. So, okay, fine. I don't care. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's a lot of people talk about writing character driven fiction. Mm -hmm. This is, this is literally character driven fiction because there is, there is no plot. <laughs> okay, like by yay. Yeah. Oh, I can't forget to ask, to ask about that because if I hung ahead. up an effort, what possessed you? That is an excellent scene. The women are all there. He, he's a chunk of meat to them at the moment. They're, all, you know, they're like, we're going to Rubaye. And it was an interesting experiment for me as a reader when you gave me the understanding of the emotional enjoyment of being there with nice clothes. Which is not my normal go-to. Just spoiler alert. <laughs> Yeah, Rubaye was. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what happened with Rubaye. Rubaye, Rubaye went someplace very different in the first draft. Uh, and my alpha reader read that chapter and said, "I laugh my ass off, but you can't use this." <laughs> <laughs> um, but but yeah, it, it, all through, particularly the shared books, but even later, um, Ishmael is defined by his clothing. And I forget, it's good enough for Shakespeare, clothes like the man. Uh, it's good enough for me. Uh, and so there's a lot of, this is, I, I, don't, I don't do a lot of the staring into the mirror kind of stuff, but he looks at his clothes. He considers himself on the basis of his clothing all the time because it's a lot of, I'm not gonna say everybody, mm -hmm. but me, in, in many cases, the way you choose to dress says something about yourself, even to yourself. And so, uh -oh. <laughs> using, well, I'm, I'm, schlepping, I'm schlepping around in my, in my hoodie and my, in my shemog. Um, but using, using that metaphor, using the clothing metaphor, using the okay, I, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to spend a lot of money on these clothes, but they make me feel good. Um, that, I, I've been there. We've played that game before. So I'm very, I was very pleased with the way that came up. Uh-oh. Hi, how are you? 
And so this is this is Kelly O'Donnell joining us live from North Carolina. Yes. And Kelly is a big fan of Nathan's. Kelly has been working with us at LMBPN for years, and uh, we are thrilled that you're here, Kelly. Well, thank you for the link, Mike. Nathan, it is fabulous to meet you. I absolutely love your books. I'm rereading them. For which time? I couldn't remember which pass through this you are. Uh, I think this is number seven. Okay, I was a little short, five or seven. Yeah. <laughs> I have a Facebook group that is basically the fans started and invited me to. Uh, I know. I'm in it. You're in it. I thought I recognized <laughs> that name. You have a sponge number. Um, I don't remember what my sponge number is. I have one as well. I have a sponge number. Uh, yeah. I had to go yeah. back and get it, but I have it. Everybody, everybody who joins the group gets a sponge number. Um, I thought I recognized that name. Uh, there's a lot of people. There's like 1,900 people in the group now, so I, I don't I don't know everybody. Um, but yeah, it's nice to see. You. Nice I'm not you. that high, thank goodness. I think I'm still in the hundreds. Is my sponge number? I think. <laughs> no, it's just it's one of those things. Um, you know, Kelly and I were talking just last week about, you know, what is she reading? She's like, I'm reading Nathan Lowell stuff, and I'm like, you know, which time you're going through it, and it, it's it's a joy of doing that, and so we're sitting here talking and I realized, wait a minute, one, Kelly's usually on or available. If I get this chance to just allow her to say hi, when I of course had a great experience, I thought I should take it. So sorry, Kelly, I didn't realize, you know, what was going on or I would have asked about this earlier and I'm thankful that you were able to at least come on and say hi before we closed up this conversation and allowed Nathan who we probably promised him we'd be done in 30 minutes and it's an hour and 45 minutes later. <laughs> or I hour and 15 minutes later. <laughs> Michael, thank you. However, either they jumped off the bunk beds or well, I, <laughs> or out just, the window, out the window, and they're in the yard. Well, I know they're not outside. That or you know the house is haunted. I, I don't know. I'm pretty sure they just jumped off the bunk beds. But I'm not here <laughs> screaming or crying for good. <laughs> so, so I'm gonna go see what they've done and. Uh, Thank you, Nathan. It was fabulous to meet you. Thank you again, Michael. That was awfully kind. I appreciate it. Hold I'll on, hold on. Can later. you do that thing? I want to get a screenshot of your little fangirl face because I will use that for the next year. Are you jealous? <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh. that, that's really oh. it. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I'll see All you right, guys bye. later. All right. Bye, Kelly. Bye. Bye. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and we, we, we probably should wrap this up. So for people who have been listening to this and who aren't familiar with the series, um, what's, what's the best entry point? What, obviously, book number one for the six-book series, but what's the title of that book? Quarter Share. Quarter Share. All right. Quarter Share. And um, the, uh, if, the most if, you like, if you like science fiction, that would be the place to start. If you like fantasy, start with Ravenwood. Ravenwood. And if you're not right. sure, start with The Wizard's Butler. <laughs> which was just released in March and um, according to the Amazon rankings is doing spectacularly well. So congratulations on that. It, it did. I am, I am boggled. I am completely and utterly boggled. It, it was above 500 for like six weeks. Um, wow. Nice. Uh, so I, I, I don't even, it was like throw it up against the wall and it's stuck. Congratulations. Right. Could not have happened to a nicer person and a better author. Thank you. Nathan, thank you for joining us here at Behind the Fiction. It certainly makes me as a fan happy to have been able to do it. And if we can ever support you on your thing, your future, let us know. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thanks to both of you for being here. And thanks to all of you for watching and or listening. If you're listening, did you know we have a YouTube channel? And if you're watching, do you know you can subscribe to the podcast? So get us every way you possibly can. Nathan, thanks so much for being here. Thanks again.